grew up with. Uh, and also <laughs> Joe Gildenhorn, thank you for sponsoring this series. Evan Thomas and I go way back. I think we were just spending time in our office talking about, and we got up to 1986 all from the stories, college. All the stories that we've misremembered. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we claim that other friends remembered them better. Uh, Being Nixon is a psychological book. It's not just about administration, but it's about what it is to be human, what it is to have fears as well as uh, ambitions. And even if you're not interested in the Nixon administration, which would be very odd, it'd be like not being interested in life itself, <laughs> you should still be interested in this book, which of course will be for sale and Evan will be signing it afterwards, because it talks about what it's like to be human. And tell us why you wrote the book. Uh, I grew up as a, a creature of the Washington Post. Really, I worked for him for 24 years. And so I almost reflexively took on a lot of the views of the so-called East Coast media establishment, of which I guess the Post was at the center. And uh, I subscribed to most of those views, one of which was that Nixon is a monster. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Nixon could be a monster. That, that view was not wrong. He did disgrace his office, and he should have been driven from it. That was, the, that was the correct outcome. But I also thought he has to be more complicated than the cartoon version. He just has to be. And, he, of course, he was. Yeah. Uh, and so it was, I have to say, although he could be a bit of a grim subject, this is the most fun book I ever wrote. Wow because he's an endlessly fascinating guy. Uh, he was, I don't, I did not crack the code. Yes, it's a psychological book, and yes, I try to get into his head, and it's called Being Nixon. Is it really what it was like to be Nixon? No. I don't, Nixon didn't know what it was like to be Nixon. Uh, and you never do totally crack the code. But you have these yellow notebook pages yeah. where he's writing the notes to himself, which almost seem to be the Rosetta Stones. Well. The good news about presidents is they leave a big trail. People are always running around collecting all the little bits and pieces of paper that they leave behind. And Nixon, not just bit, bits of paper, it's tapes. Yeah. It's 3,700 hours of tapes. So all presidents leave a trail. Nixon left a particularly good trail from the tapes, from notes that he has. Nixon, who hated, didn't like people very much. The joke was his best friend was his yellow legal pad. He was always walking around with his yellow legal pad. And he wrote notes to himself <laughs> late at night. And on these notes, and this really got my attention early on when I just started this, he would write notes about the person he wanted to be. Joyful, upbeat, optimistic, serene, inspiring, all the things that he was not or, or struggled to be. Was sometimes, but struggled to be. So I was touched by that that this, this man wanted to be a better person than he was capable of being. There was something poignant about that. You can really see it in his family relations. He was in many ways a good father, and even, I say this carefully, a good husband. Now, not always a good husband. He, he was a faithful husband, but he, was, he was, could be cruel to Pat in public. He could embarrass her in public. And it made people go, ooh, God, what a disaster of a marriage. But there are a lot of counterindicators that suggest really the opposite. I mean, she hated politics, but at least five times that I've found, she keeps him from quitting politics mm -hmm. because she understood that without politics, he'd be dead. And he would regret it for the rest of his life. She sacrificed herself for him to do this. And it's touching. And he, he although by the end of Watergate, is apart from her. I mean, he, when he decides to resign, he tells Rosemary Woods, his secretary, to tell her. That's how distant they are by August 1974. According to Julie, they're both drinking too much. It's a mess. But other times in the marriage, certainly early in the marriage, their love letters are incredibly powerful. And at the end of the marriage, you want to see a site, uh, Google Pat Nixon's funeral. She's, he's not just crying. He's bawling. He is inconsolable. He is undone by the loss of her. And within a year, he's dead. Mm -hmm. I talked to their housekeeper. And they're very old-fashioned marriage, very courtly. He would pull out the chair for her. But a very solicitous and courtly. It's not a modern marriage as we understand it. 
They, were, they didn't like to talk about their bodily ills around each other. They didn't like confrontation. But they were very attentive at the same time. They read each other. And although he could be rude to her in public, I think he paid a lot of attention to her, and she knew that. So you know, I didn't crack the code on their marriage either. But I was interested in it, and I thought it was a lot more complicated than that one, you know, that one photograph of Pat Nixon who mm -hmm. looks so tired and strained. I intentionally put in the book a photograph of her in 1953 because she looks like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. She's a knockout. She's a, it's a, it's a, she's she's a this is a he, there he's vice president, and uh, she you're not going to be able to see this picture because you're too far away. But uh, I intentionally because she's about 15 pounds heavier, and uh, damn it, where is this picture? She is just a great beauty. Yeah, this is it. If you look at this picture of her, this is on page 74. Uh, he's the young, and he also has this look of the, uh, on his face of the guy in high school who, got who, who can't believe his good luck <laughs> that he married the babe. And he, he, was so, he pursued her so ardently that Richard Nixon used to drive Pat on dates to see other boys. I am. <laughs> he, Nixon was a strange, strange. H.R. Haldeman needy. said of Nixon, the strangest man I ever met. That's his chief of staff describing it. <laughs> and very needy and weird. But but he, you know, it wore it, it worked. I mean, he would dutifully, he would he read in hotel lobbies while she was out on dates with other men, and then he'd drive her home. And eventually she, eventually she said yes. Yeah. Speaking of family, I mean, let's stay on that train. Uh, there's part of it where he likes to whistle when he comes up the yeah. elevator to yeah. impress the kids. Uh, and I think there was, you talked about those yeah. memos, one called The Spiritual Lift. I yeah, think yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, this is again, it was pointing to me. I read an oral history from Julie who described Nixon coming home at night. He walk, when he walks in the front door, he's whistling, an upbeat two-note whistle. He turns on all the lights. He puts a show tune on the record player. He only wants to have cheerful talk at dinner, nothing, nothing negative. And he's, he, need, he wants to be upbeat. He wants to be confident. He wants to be happy. And he works at it. Now, of course, he's, I think he's fighting the darkness. I mean, he's at late at night. The gloom comes back in. But what got me was the struggle to be happy. And what got me in this whole book was the struggle, because he struggles yeah, every it. day. I mean, we know about his fears and his dark <coughs> side. But I think one of the themes of the book is there's a hope side in, that is forcing him to struggle. This is a battle he lost, right? Watergate happened. The darkness got him. And one of the sub-themes of the book is about self-awareness. I spent a lot of time trying to find out whether Nixon was self-aware. Mm -hmm. This is a very difficult, complicated question because well, I, let me do. I would ask people, was Nixon self-aware? And they would say, no. Brent Skullcroft said, well, I think sometimes he took a peek. Uh, <laughs> and, but uh, 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 Jim Schlesinger got me because I asked oh, Jim Schlesinger before he died, and was Nixon self-aware? And Schlesinger said, no. And then he looked out the window and he said, who is? Fair question. But particularly relevant to great men and women. Because when you think about it, if you want to go out and solve the world's problems, you can't wake up in the morning going, oh, gosh, I'm, where are the car keys? And you know, am I getting along with my daughter? And you know, I'm really yeah, not that good a person after Self-awareness tends to be paralyzing. It can be way. paralyzing. Self-awareness can be paralyzing. I mean, it certainly paralyzed me at times. Yeah. You know, it paralyzes all of us at times. Mm -hmm. So there is a quality often in great men of being you know, blinders on. Somebody once described, William James once described, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., as being like on a plow, just plowing ahead, not looking to the left or the right, just cutting this furrow through life. And, and a lot of great men have that kind of almost manic drive to do what they're going to do. And of course, they have to be, they have to have delusions of grandeur. If you're going to think you're going to save the world, you have to believe that you can do it. And that's why, unsurprisingly, Lincoln, and Churchill, I believe today, would be diagnosed as manic depressive. Mm -hmm. you know, they had the great highs and also the black dog. They had the, the downs that, that came with it. So 
I, I think there's a tricky issue, self-awareness, but Nixon showed almost none of it until the last day he's leaving the White House. I just couldn't believe this. He's leaving the White House, and uh, right before he gets on the helicopter, and he's talking to his staff, and he says, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, you can hate your enemies, but if you do, they win. Mm -hmm. You destroy yourself. And you feel like going, too late. Mm -hmm. did, this, did this just occur to you? <laughs> you know, did you suddenly just realize yeah, that right. it's a mistake to hate your enemies? And so I looked and looked in the record for any sign of him having this moment of self-awareness. There were flickers. He, he says to Ed Cox, you know, this is like a Shakespearean tragedy or a Greek tragedy, you know, it's got to play itself out. I actually went and it, it, the Nixon Library, they have the school papers. I wanted to see what he read and stuff. He did read Shakespeare's Julius Caesar mm -hmm. in, in college. He wrote a paper about it. It's a terrible paper. He totally <laughs> missed the point. He didn't get the hubris piece, right. you know. Uh, if he had only had a better teacher, we would have had a different history. Well, I mean, I, I, it's kind of snobby to say that because I think Whittier in some ways was a good college. But, but my reading of his formal education yeah, was Yeah, but I mean, he understood deficient. the hubris of Julius Caesar. He would have... Uh, would have. I mean, maybe. You wish, you, one wishes. Um, you know, we... Um, it's kind of parochial here. We're looking at Georgetown. Half the people I see out here were. I was struck by a lot of the um, discomfort he had with the Georgetown crowd. He sure did. And I was uh, remembering, if I have it correctly, that his first formal dinner in the White House, he decides to have Alice Roosevelt Katie Longworth, who yeah. is the ultimate yeah. of that crowd, and with Polly, I mean, with. Um, Right. I guess it was yeah. the All Sops and yeah. Mrs. Graham. Joe also was also at that first dinner. That's what I meant. Yeah. This is the dinner yeah. party they have, yeah. and um, then you later have uh, I think Mrs. Longworth saying to the British ambassador, you know, what a common little He's man. A common little man. Yeah. So what was I mean? You know, what was his uh, desire or hope or fear there? Yeah. Well, first of all, Mrs. Long, Alice Longworth is a complicated person herself. And she, right. with the British, when she said, what a common little man with a British ambassador, she's trying to be provocative. She's trying to get a rise <laughs> out of him. So Alice, you know, Alice Roosevelt was somebody who praised Hitler yeah. to irritate her cousin. Yeah. Uh, so, and, but, but, but they bonded, Roosevelt and Alice bonded, because Alice was in her own weird way an outsider. I'm sorry, Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Alice Roosevelt praised hit, hit Hitler to irritate Franklin Roosevelt. And, but you, who did she bond with? I'm sorry, bonded with Nixon. Alice, okay, okay. Alice and Nixon bonded because although Alice was a Roosevelt and lived right around the block here in a big house and was obviously socially uh, part of an elite, she herself was an outsider in a, in a weird way. Remember, in her own family, she's the child of the first parent and first, yeah. uh, and then she's not really included in the larger family, and feels resentful. She has a whole complicated cycle. I don't mean to get going on her. But yeah, and she but she whole, married Nicholas Longworth, yeah. so she is part of the crowd. She is part of the crowd. But the the point about the crowd is that Nixon, from the get go, felt alienated from this crowd. He the the story I tell, which is uh, uh, Tish Alsop and others tell it, is that. Uh, they, they had their doubts about Nixon from the beginning because he exposes Alger Hiss as a Soviet spy. Alger Hiss is one of theirs. He's a Harvard Law School guy, and it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. to, so that's the, that sort of salts the ground. But he, he wins a Senate race in 1950, and Joe Alsop invites him to a Sunday night supper. The Sunday night supper is this kind of ritual gathering of Georgetown, the cool crowd. In high school, it would be the, mm -hmm. the cool crowd. And Nixon and Pat arrive, and of course, Alsop forgets his name and introduces him as Russell Nixon. <laughs> and Averill Harriman, Ambassador Harriman, turns his plate over, turns off his hearing aid, and says, I will not break bread with that man, and walks out. Now, how do you think the Nixons felt, <laughs> Mrs. Nick? How do you think Miss Pat Nixon felt at this moment? So this starts early, and it gets worse. And the story I tell of it getting worse is about Henry Kissinger. And like all things in Washington, a complicated story. Mm -hmm. Nixon, as part, after this first dinner that you described where he has Alice and all that, he, he wants to get along with Georgetown. So he deputizes 
Henry Kissinger to be his ambassador to the court of Catherine Gray, <laughs> knowing that Kissinger will do well. And Kissinger does well. Kissinger, you know, a lot of you know him. He's funny. He's charming. He can do something that Nixon could never do on a bet. He's self-deprecating. Henry Kissinger woos you by being self, you know, calling himself excellency and being self-deprecating. It worked like a charm. And so Mrs. Graham loved Henry Kissinger, and Polly Fritchie, all that whole crowd did. But Kissinger, who has his own insecurities, starts making joke, jokes about the President of the United States. And of course, that gets back to Nixon. Of course he hears about it. And he tries to be philosophical about it. You can see it. You can hear it on the tapes. You know, he'll say, well, there goes Henry to, to leak to the Washington Post, or there goes Henry to see his friends in Georgetown. But he's upset about it, and, uh, you know, he's spying on Kissinger to find out. In fact, the, the famous tapes, this is a little understood, a little known about the tapes. The tapes don't get installed until February 1971. It's almost two years in. Yeah. Why do Why the tapes get installed? Nixon has taken out all of Johnson's tapes because he doesn't want to be spied upon, particularly by the Pentagon. Johnson's tapes were installed by the Signal Corps, and Nixon thinks, if I have the Signal Corps taping me, the Pentagon's going to know exactly what I'm doing. Actually, the Pentagon was spying on Nixon. <laughs> they had a yeoman going through yeah. his burn bag. Radford, right? Yeah, Admiral Radford. They were formally spying on him. But Nixon, so Nixon, no tapes. Until the winter of 1971, he decides that Henry Kissinger is going around ta town saying all the victories are his, Right? All the good ideas are his. He's the dove. Nixon's the hawk. Going to China was, is Nick, you know. And Nixon wants a record. And he's explicit about this with Haldeman. He wants a record so that when he writes his memoirs, they're going to know whose idea it was to go to China. Actually, it was Nixon's idea. Kissinger executed it brilliantly. He did. Kissinger was a brilliant national security advisor. And he did as no other person could. He did what Nixon wanted. But it was what Nixon wanted. And that's not quite the story Kissinger is telling as, he, as he's making the round. So that's why the system is put in. Now, of course, it hung. It, it was a, as, as Kissinger himself said, I think, in your book. He said it was, yeah, it's a, I got this quote from you, Walter. That's right. Uh, <laughs> he says it was a, something like it was a high price to pay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got uh, it from Kissinger, so I don't yeah. got it. <laughs> um, but who called whom an unloved child? And should it have been both ways? Yeah. Uh, right. Kissinger said if only Nixon had been loved. And of course you could say the same for Kissinger, I guess. I mean, the, the point they both is... Had a, they both fed on each other's insecurities they, is and, what I'm and, asking about. Then they were sympathetic to each other. Today, if you ask Henry Kissinger about Nixon, as I have, he's tender about him. He's very, very sympathetic and paints a very sophisticated and gentle portrait of him. I got my gentle portrait comes partly from Kissinger. That's Kissinger today. Kissinger then, mm, Kissinger was on, man on the make. We've all, everybody in this room has been in that position and he was willing to do things or did do things, partly because of his own insecurities, which Kissinger today at the age of 90 can kind of joke about, but at the time he, he was insecure. He was famously insecure. He, he, Working for Henry Kissinger was a nightmare. You know, he he, he basically belittled his aides and and we'll get to that with the home. audience in a moment. But um, <laughs> in fact, in just one moment, I'm about to do it. But um, on the most substantive thing they did, the question leaving aside China was decent interval, yeah. and you have yeah. a lot about that. This is a really tricky question, and I wish I had a clean answer about yeah. this. You know, the the theory of the decent interval mm -hmm. is that. Kissinger and Nixon kept the war going, intentionally kept the Vietnam War going because they didn't want the government in South Vietnam to collapse too soon and Nixon to be blamed for it in the 72 election. So they keep the war going just long enough to be elected in 1972 and then they let the government collapse. That's the theory. There is evidence to support the theory, particularly from Kissinger. Kissinger makes some cynical comments about this. In fact, Kissinger does tell the Chinese that well, that's he, the I think he invents a phrase. Right? Yeah, they, they talk about a, a decent vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's his, or it may be Hall. Well, we're going to find remember. out in a minute, because yeah, I have people yeah. in the audience who know, know this. 
So that's, that's the theory. And I think there's, like all theories, there's something to it. But the counter evidence is that when you listen to the tapes of Nixon, very at times, he sounds like he wants to win. He's, he's not just prolonged. He's not cynical. You know, he, he, he's always mad at the Air Force for not doing enough. You know, it, it's, it's crude. He'll shout, you know, bomb the fuckers. He'll, he'll shout in the office. Uh, and so it, he sounds to me like a guy who wants to win now. He doesn't want to wait to win. He wants to win now. So I, my view of Nixon is that it was more erratic. Uh, Nixon was erratic. I think oh, sometimes yeah. he was cynical about this, and other times he wanted to win. At other times he, he thought that Kissinger was being a chump, letting the North Vietnamese dangle out the prospects of peace talks that really weren't going to happen. At other times, he wants to do it himself. I think the record is all over the place on this. I think a true scholar is eventually going to sort it out. But I, I was confused by this, frankly. Let's get a microphone to John Negroponte, who <laughs> was the person negotiating in Vietnam <laughs> and uh, worked for Dr. Kissinger yeah. and was on the, you know, anyway, everybody knows who John Negroponte is. <laughs> So, I mean, but you were once very young when you we, did that. <laughs> we don't have enough time to go over uh, all of this long story. So let me just say on the Vietnam peace talks and a question that kind of yeah. mystifies me, and I'm wondering if in your research you could shed any light. Uh, I mean, I think that your theory about, you know, the different theories about the war, I think what they were trying to do as they tried to find some peaceful solution was to reduce the cost of the war to the American people, right. uh, particularly the casualties. I think that was the main objective of withdrawing those troops on the systematic right. basis that they did. And I mean, I was inside. I didn't see anything particularly conspiratorial going on here. I just saw these people not able to solve by negotiations this terrible problem they'd inherited and said, well, the next best thing is let's just Right. Get it down to the point where we have five casualties a week or no casualties a week, and then we can yeah. sustain the cost better. So here's the yeah. question, though. We get down to this point, and then we have October of 72 uh, comes up, and late October produces this piece of paper and uh, on the 8th of October, and Henry precipitates himself on it, and we ultimately sign the agreement that... Uh, he had Winston Lord and me and Peter Rodman negotiating with the uh, late of Taw's people for three or four days. And right. We interrupted the talks, but then we resumed them again later on. My question is, since we had it pretty good in Vietnam by that point, I realize our political will as a nation had maybe been dissipated, why did Nixon, and Henry intimated this a number of times, why did Nixon want to adhere so rigidly to this timetable of not having to worry about Vietnam after he takes office the second time. And, and that comes through in various uh, commentary that was made. Even I heard Henry say to Joe and Lai, uh, we don't want to be reading battlefield reports uh, for breakfast uh, in the second administration. So do you get any insight on why the rush in January of 1973? You know, I don't have a good answer to your question. Uh, I mean, he was sick of the whole thing, obviously. I mean, just at a visceral level. Uh, he wanted it to be over with. Uh, I think the Christmas bombing took it out of him. He felt that we had to, we had to do that, basically, for the, South, for the sake of the South Vietnamese. We did, when we, the famous Christmas bombing in 72, it was partly to convince Chu that we're going to stand by him, not to convince the North Vietnamese. Uh, once... Once we've done that and he's got, you know, we finally do get a deal, I think he wants, he's sick of it. He wants to be done with it. He wants to be rid of it. Now, here's the complicating piece. Watergate is starting to rear its ugly head just at this moment. I think Nixon's own radar about Watergate is... But is, you're talking about January 73. This is January 73. in October 72, Watergate... It, Watergate, it's, uh, he, he, in, in 72, he, he, he thinks he's, he's got a, October 72, he thinks he's got a deal. He thinks that uh, Kissinger stepped in it by saying peace, peace is, is, at, is at hand. Uh, two objects, is unhappy. There's this kerfluffle at the end. They have to bomb again. 
uh, basically to pl please Chu, but also to sort of push the North Vietnamese to get the deal that they were going to get anyways in October. And then they sign a deal in January. And Nixon does want to be done with Vietnam at this point. It, it, there's a question of whether once the North Vietnamese inevitably violated the peace accords, why didn't we bomb them? By then, it's war. It is Watergate. We've mm -hmm. never found a note that says, "I'm sick and tired of this. We got to get out of here by no. January 20th." That's no. That's my source. Of yeah. No. Uh, yeah. You know, they're they're still de erratic and hard to read. Scared, you know, pushes this idea of Secretary of Defense of America of Vietnamization, yeah, where we're going to and we do reduce the casualties. The problem is we lose some of our leverage. If you're, if you're reducing casualties by reducing forces, you're having a hard time pressuring the North with military force to concede. And Kissinger hope, is hoping to perform a miracle, basically, of negotiating a peace when you're losing your leverage. He can't do it. The North Vietnamese have beaten the Japanese. They've beaten the French. They're patient. They're just going to hang in there. Finally, in, the, in May of 1972, we mine Haiphong Harbor and we bomb Hanoi, and, the, and there's a little bit of linkage here. The Chinese and the Russians are maybe not quite there with mm. Hanoi. And they do. They finally move a little tiny bit. They allow Chu to stay in power for a while. I mean, it's a, it's and a, I guess it's a decent it's, interval. It's a decent, it, that tends to the decent interval. So the North Vietnamese finally, after we bomb the hell out of them in May 1972, they do move a little bit, just enough to get a deal. But it's a pretty thin victory. You know, I, I'm really interested in your question, John, because you were so much there with Henry, and it never occurred to me to ask the question that way, but you think that had they not felt pressure, they would have continued the war, or should have continued the war? It was conceivable to do that. I'm not arguing I never thought it, but it was conceivable, uh, number one, and the other point was that Henry told us that it was the president who was rushing him, not he himself. Now, you know, that was Henry talking. Boy, the, the, the dance between Nixon and Kissinger in this period, December 1972, is so intricate that they went back and dictated memos to file, both of them blaming the other guy for having screwed Why it up. Why did right. Henry say peace is at hand in October? Oh, that I thought was fairly easy. Uh, what happened was we had negotiated the agreement that, that October 8 to 12 time frame. We went to Saigon on the 17th. And Henry had this whole scenario laid out where he'd go then to Hanoi, and then we'd have a ceasefire, which conveniently would take place three days before the election. That was the scenario. President Thieu balked. He'd never even seen a Vietnamese version of the agreement. He had the English translation, and he said, you know, I just can't do this. So Nixon decided he didn't, he didn't want to be seen to be pulling the plug on Saigon on the eve of the election, so we, we backed off. Henry bomb. had his press conference when he got back from Saigon, in my opinion, to reassure the North Vietnamese that we were going to come back to the table. Don't worry, this is a hiccup. Peace is at hand, and we'll be back to finish this thing off. And that's exactly right. what they did. All right. We're going to get on to other matters, but I just uh, want to point out one yeah. thing, because it's my favorite line. I want to make sure it's true. You said uh, that President Thieu of South Vietnam had not seen the agreement in its Vietnamese form. Correct. But apparently at one point they found a captured copy of it and President Thieu shows it to Kissinger to say, yes, we have this, is this right? And the line, in apocryphal perhaps, as Kissinger says, it has the odious smell of truth to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let me go. Did you watch? Uh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. You listen to hundreds of hours of tapes. Did you hear the prejudice against blacks or Jews or other the Jews, minorities? Yeah, not so much blacks. Uh, it, it, Nixon was a blurter, and, a, and it, to use a word, an odious blurter. Uh, he, there are, there's a terrible tape where he's, there, he's ordering to count up the number of Jews in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This goes on and on. And they get uh, Fred, they get Fred, Fred Malik. Malik. Yeah. First they have to check to see if Fred's a Jew. <laughs> uh, and then he has to count him up. He's been living this one down for years. And then in the court of the weird way of bureaucracies, they end up replacing <clears throat> an Anglo-Saxon with a Jew to run it. So it's just, you know, a typical Nixon. It, it, no, nothing ever makes any sense. But it's, uh, when you listen to these tapes, 
my wife, Osi, listened to a lot of these tapes. And I could see her visibly recoiling in the seat next to me at the Nixon Library as she's listening to him. Nixon was an ugly blurter. And, but the thing about his blurts, they sound fake to me. It's like a guy showing off. If you want to hear good swearing, listen to LBJ's tapes. <laughs> Nixon has this quality of, you know, if, if I say shit, it'll really impress the guys that I'm a real man. You know, it just, it just, it feels tinny and fake. And some of his blurting is, has that kind of feeling of fakeness about it because other tapes, he will get, he's deeply intellectual. I mean, hilarious. Nixon was always denouncing intellectuals. He said, quote, I hate intellectuals. There's something effeminate about them. I'd rather talk to an athlete. <laughs> he's a bad athlete. And he is an intellectual. <laughs> I, I asked yeah, to see Nixon's private, private library. And yeah, right. right. I asked to see Nixon's private library. It's like a grad student's. All, you know, he's got all these philosophers and political theorists underlining stars in the margin. You think regular presidents do that kind of reading? Not a chance. Mm -hmm. He was much more intellectual than, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt was in there. There have been intellectual presidents, but he was pretty unusual that way. But he needed because it made him seem manly in that kind of 50s macho way. So a lot of this, I think, is posturing. Now, at what point does the posturing end and the actual not-so-nice Nixon emerge? Well, he, he did some pretty ugly stuff. I have a theory on that, which is there were people who reinforced his light side and people who reinforced his dark side. Jeff Colson in there quite a bit. But there are people, including Henry Kissinger, could work either side he of could. him. He could. And he when could. you actually sort of tried to suck out his dark side, he would get dark. Well, Colson, you mentioned, somebody asked, what, what, what is Colson's constituency? And, and the answer, I guess it was John Mitchell, said Nixon's worst instincts. <laughs> That's right. Because yeah. uh, right. Colson would get in to show the pot. And, and Haldeman, who's a tragic figure in all this, a chief of staff who ran a tight ship I mean, that was a well-run White House with a very clear paper flow and delay, all this. But Haldeman obviously eventually loses control because the White House goes down. I mean, the greatest failure in history of chiefs of staff. Haldeman, you can see Haldeman trying to control Colson. Colson's sneaking in. Colson, unfortunately, his office was next to Nixon's mm -hmm. hideaway. And <laughs> Colson would sneak in behind Haldeman and, and get Nixon ginned up to do stupid. And, and, and then would then carry him out. I mean. Nixon, and then we carry him out. That's Kissinger's the key thing. famous line is, how did Watergate happen? Said some damn fool went into the Oval Office and did what Nixon told him. Correct. Nick, Nixon, Nixon, there are indications on the tapes that Nixon expected his subordinates not to carry out his That's orders. Point. Yeah. That he, would, he knew he was going to blurt and have a couple of drinks and cork off. But the next, and there's, there's been, Kissinger learned this in summer 1970, early in the going, there's a hijacked airplane that lands at Damascus. Nixon has a couple of drinks with Bibi and says, bomb the airport. And Kissinger goes, oh my god, what do I do? So overnight, he and Laird are moving the Sixth Fleet around. And, <laughs> and in the morning, it's clear to Kissinger that Nixon didn't really mean it. Okay. And so, you know, Kissinger got the message. And Haldeman mostly got the message. But the lower, lower, you know, the dean level, they didn't really get the message. So then when they hear about enemies lists and all that, they take it seriously. And, and dean wants to show what an eager beaver he is, so he starts investigating people. And Nixon kind of meant it, but some of it is just blurting. And one of the things that happens I think is relevant. I think Haldeman and Ehrlichman get exhausted. Haldeman especially is a 24-7 chief of staff. I mean, he is always there. Mm -hmm. there and uh, there's always a phone ring, and we, Osi and I, interviewed his his, wi his widow, uh, Joe, and Haldeman wasn't married to Joe. Haldeman was married to Nixon. But I think it took it out of him. I think by the fourth or fifth year, Haldeman is baked. He's cooked. And there's just nothing. He was a pretty strong guy, but there's nothing left to him. And he's losing his grasp, and he, he does badly in Watergate. And I think part of it, I don't know the whole story, obviously, but part of it, I think, is fatigue. It's just being worn out. They needed to change Chiefs of Staff. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Evan, uh, first of all, uh, a fabulous job. I brought this thing two Thank weeks you. ago. Thank you. When I was on vacation uh, and, and um, having read not all but 
lots of the other Nixon books. I just think this one walks away with a prize, as did your Robert Kennedy book, having Thank said you. that. Hear that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, is, it is a page turner, I will tell you. Um, so I had a discussion with some people about this book and was raving about it. And the question, they asked me a question which I want to ask you, which is, that in the final analysis, after all of this enormous uh, research that you clearly have done, prodigious research, and you were there, you covered him, you, et cetera, when it was all said and done, what fundamental differences did you come to about this character? What fundamental differences uh, as? Di in other words, prior to writing the book, well. then you, and, yeah. and it, it yeah. isn't, in other words, it isn't yeah. like you were writing about something yeah, 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 you yeah. hadn't yeah, known. I wish I had a clean answer to that. I have a murky answer, which has more to do with my own journalism. Uh, at Time and Newsweek, we always wrote in this omniscient tone. We didn't know what the hell we were talking about. But at the, at the end of every week, when I, and I, would, I wrote a lot of these stories. I wrote, you know, literally 100 or more cover stories at, at Newsweek. I think I wrote as many as anybody. But the tone was always this Olympian, we know what the hell we're talking about. And of course, I was acutely aware that we didn't know what we were talking about, or we knew some of what we were talking about. And so uh, I, that made me interested in all the parts that we didn't know about. But it's, it's not clean. It's not clean. Just as our, our Newsweek cover stories, our Time cover stories, were maybe 80% accurate. It's not that they were horrible. It's just that they were missing a piece. And, but the 20% the, the is also, you know, it's elusive. I don't, I would like to say I ex, ex, am exposing the hidden Nixon that you didn't know. Not really. I'm, I'm exposing more of the Nixon maybe than you knew, but I'm sure I'm mixing a lot of Nixon that other future historians will find. They're, they're still, de in the U.S. government, they declassify documents forever. You know, I mean, a lot of stuff is still classified. I bet you, I bet you there's some nasty little surprises that are still going to pop out. Um, because that's the nature of history, and that's the nature of writing about presidents. So I don't have the whole picture, but I'm curious about this other side, and it's always more complicated than it's such a cliche. It's such a cliche. It's more complicated than it seems. Well, it is more complicated than it seems, and that's fun. That's fun. For biographers, that's the kind of fun part, is mm -hmm. trying to find the wrinkles. And often they're wrinkles. They're not, we know the basic picture of Nixon. He broke the law. He committed high crimes and misdemeanors. He should have been driven from office. We, we, you know, that's true. I didn't find the opposite. But I, but I found things like this. When you listen to his tapes about the, he didn't know about the crime. He didn't know about the break-in. A lot of people don't know. He didn't have any idea about the break-in. He was involved in the cover-up. But in the cover-up, it's not like he's going, we're going to pay off this witness, and we're going to suborn perjury here, and we're going to do this. There's some of that, but there's more of him kind of wanting to know what's going on and then backing off. He'll say to Haldeman, what did John Mitchell really know? And Haldeman will say, Haldeman will be a little circumlocutious, and then Nixon will back off. And then he can't help himself, and he'll come back to him. Well, what did Mitchell really know? And then he doesn't want to know. And he, he's going, it's like this reciprocating machine going back and forth. It's messy. Does he know it's he's clumsy. being taped at that moment? Yeah. I mean, obviously he knows. So that's but another. But is he conscious? So I like, think gee, I'm being taped. I'm going to ask that question. Sometimes I think you can hear him saying things for the record. Well, that would be wrong. Yeah. You can hear him saying things for the record on the tape. <coughs> Sometimes. But at other times, I think he forgets the tape is there. And he's just, because it's so ugly and stupid, uh, he, he must have forgotten the tape yeah, is Yeah, I can. Yeah. I mean, he, when he's, to he's like, tapes. I know somewhere we can get a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. You know? That kind of, you know, nutty talk, but it's rambling, it's incoherent, it's not the criminal mastermind planning out how we're going to subvert the Constitution tomorrow. It's just not that way at all. It's a frightened, lonely man with too much on his plate, too much to do. He can't remember. You know, John Dean will be briefing him and Nixon's gone, did I just hear that? Or, you know, he'll ask, so sometimes he's asking questions he knows the answer to for effect, and maybe he's doing it to establish a record, it's a little hard to know whether his ignorance is feigned or real, right? But there's enough real ignorance on it that you, I don't, wouldn't say I feel sorry for Nixon and Watergate, but you kind of go, oh, Jesus. Yeah. 
are you missing a chance here to save your presidency? I mean, sometimes you listen to these tapes and you want to go, stop! <laughs> Don't do it! There's, I mean, there's a, there's a tape, uh, I couldn't believe this, March 12, 1973. John Dean has been digging their grave for months, obstructing justice. And Haldeman and the president are having a conversation about what a great guy John Dean is and how smart he is and how brilliant and how he gets a lot of girls. Ah, he gets a lot of sex. And they're kind of envious of that. How does he get so much sex? <laughs> and of course, he's killing They don't know. He's killing them. He's about to sell them out to the government. And it's, it's what they don't know. You know, it's what they, they, they talk about. They have these conversations about E. Howard Hunt. E. Howard Hunt, he's a real James Bond, you know. He's a great master spy. E. Howard Hunt was a clown who was dumped on the White House by Richard Helms, who was trying to get rid of him because Hunt had screwed up the Bay of Pigs and everything else he touched. And so in classic bureaucratic fashion, it's a dumping ground. Liddy is dumped on Treasury, which dumps him on the White House, to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. But the guy's running him, and he's run. Hunt and Liddy are run by Eagle Crow. Do any of you know Eagle Krogh? Eagle Krogh's nickname in the White House was Evil Krogh. Mm -hmm. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. He's a Boy Scout. He's, I think, literally an Eagle Scout. He's a nice man. He's a decent. Yeah. He writes book, books about ethics now. Yeah. He was the most miscast head of the plumbers. Yeah. And the only reason they did the plumbers, I'm going on too long here, but the only reason they do the plumbers, they had to go in-house because the FBI, this is a little historical context, which always gets dropped out of this, Nixon initially wants the FBI to investigate Daniel Ellsberg. White House, you know, Pentagon Papers come out. Nixon freaks out about him, even though the words Richard Nixon are not in the Pentagon Papers. But he's worried about leaks and just generally mad. So he says to Hoover, you go get Ellsberg. Hoover, smart politician that he is, sees that the wind is changing. Mm -hmm. The FBI had been doing political intelligence for Lyndon Johnson. They spied on dissident Democrats at the 1964 Democratic Convention. Hoover, that's how Hoover stayed in office, being a spy for presidents and digging up dirt on them. But by 1969, 1970, Hoover knows the wind is changing. The Warren Court has discovered the Fourth Amendment. Greg Craig is sitting here. Edward Bennett Williams was bringing lawsuits against the FBI for illegal wiretapping. It's having an impact. Hoover gets out of the illegal wiretapping business. So what does that mean? Nixon has to go in-house, hence the plumbers. Mm -hmm. he, he has an internal investigative unit, which are a bunch of clowns who get caught. <laughs> Greg, did you want to add to that? Or is it, uh, uh, Bennett Johnson, my, was my senator from the state of Louisiana, a young senator when this was happening. Yeah. Uh, Evan, why in the world did Nixon not uh, destroy the tapes when he had a chance, right. and could he have survived, could his presidency have survived if he did? He, he, wrote, he wrote a little note, in the ho he was in the hospital with the pneumonia when the, when the tapes were disclosed, and they did have a discussion about it, and he actually wrote himself a little note after a couple of days, should have destroyed the tapes. When the subpoenas arrive, it's probably too late, but there was a, like a 48-hour window when they, they could have, and they should have. Uh, I think Edward Bennett Williams has always said, I would have told him to have a bonfire on the lawn. Haig suggested, and he has suggested Manolo, the, his Manolo burned them on the lawn. But Nixon doesn't do it. Uh, he's sick, for one thing. Uh, Agnew also suggests they destroy him. Uh, but Leonard Garment, his, one of his lawyers, says don't. And Nixon also thinks the tapes may vindicate him. He has a bad memory of what's on the tapes. Right. I know. I, but, but he also, right. I mean, that was my but point he does. earlier. He, he really has, does. He has said things specifically to be on the tape, and he forgets all the things he, that he didn't He remember. does. This is, we were talking about memory beforehand. This is how memory will, will Did Rose, I mean, how did the uh, gap happen? I don't know. This is one of the mysteries. How I'm assuming know? Nixon was guilty somehow. Poor Rosemary probably was ordered to. And she did it. Him. Okay. But, but there is, there, I think there's six or seven times when somebody's, that sounds like Nixon. Nixon was physically uncoordinated. One reason why they have a, it's voice activated is that Nixon could not open an aspirin bottle. Yeah. Nixon would sign a bill and you know, there's a sort of, he drops the cap, and then he puts the pen in the mouth the wrong way. People are on their hands and knees trying to find it. And, you know, he was just forever, he was just physically uncoordinated, especially when he felt socially awkward. So it's an automatic voice-activated taping system, which, which, which captures everything, unfortunately, for him. Mm -hmm.
Damien, yeah. Damien. Do you think alcohol played into this story, and not only in those critical years, but in the lead up, in the culture at large, but specifically when you talk about yeah. memory? I mean, you've mentioned it a few times. Yeah, uh, there's a big debate about Nixon, and there are two schools on this. Uh, his some of his close aides deny it; they only saw him have no drinks or one drink. Other people, well, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, who are Christian Scientists, think he was bombed all the time, <laughs> but that's. You know, to Ehrlichman, one drink is getting bucked. So, uh, so what's the truth? Uh, I think he had a low capacity, and he never slept, so he's exhausted. I think this also has a lot to do with 1950s pharmacology. Uh, this is not my research. This is uh, 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 Herb Gelman. Got his medical reports, and he, I don't remember the names of all these drugs, but he's taking a barbiturate-based tranquilizer prescribed to him by Dr. Hutchnecker as sort of quasi-shrink. A barbiturate, a, a amphetamine-based upper called Edamil, I think it's called, which they take off the market. He's taking second all, which has barbiturates in it. And I found in his diary of his osteopath that they gave him a Valium before he took the second all. Because they had to basically use horse tranquilizers because the guy couldn't sleep. So he's got coursing through his system drugs that wouldn't even be on the market today. Uh, this Now, John F. Kennedy had a famous cocktail prescribed to him by, remember, Dr. Feelgood? Feel good, yeah. And it's got uppers and downers in it. And, and Kennedy famously says, I don't care what's in it. I don't care if there's horse piss in it, if it works. <laughs> Kennedy takes that, a shot of that, before he meets Khrushchev at the summit that he screws up. In Vienna, remember this yeah. in Vienna, when, he's, when, he's, when he, he makes a hash of that summit. He's high on whatever the hell Dr. Feelgood put in that. So part of it is, is the pharmacology of the age. I do think in Nixon's last year, Julie, even Julie, writes, Mom and Dad are drinking too much. If Julie's writing that in her memoirs, you can be damn sure Mom and Dad were drinking a lot. Uh, so I think at the end, he's pretty hammered. Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, fast as I uh, possibly can, any of the four um, wingtips on the beach, if you could get to that, um, <laughs> Lincoln Memorial, um, and well, just three. Uh, Bob Dole said at the funeral, that the bottom half of the 20th century will be known as the age of Nixon. Yeah. So could you look at that yeah. uh, in the context yeah. of the imperial presidency and investigative journalism? And the man to see is available for those who don't have it uh, <laughs> at Amazon yeah. uh, and bookstores everywhere. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, the wingtips, this is a this is poor Nixon. I hate to call Nixon a victim, but the famous photograph of him on the beach walking on you know, his wingtips, he's actually not wearing wingtips. So if you look closely at the photograph, he's wearing hush puppies. Now, this is a <laughs> small thing, but it's typical of this. And it, what the, but it's a comparison with Kennedy. Kennedy looked great in his bare feet and with his pants rolled up and the windswept hair and all that. Poor Nixon, it's January and, and it's cold. He did like, he loved going to the beach. And he's waving awkwardly at the photograph. And people made fun of the photograph. He knew it actually, he knew right away it was a mistake. Uh, Joe Holman had made me. We had to, uh, the Haldeman knew right away that this photograph was going to mm -hmm. backfire against him. It was his birth, you're right, it was his birthday. Uh, so that was sort of a cruel moment. Uh, what was the, the memorial? Memor memor Lincoln Memorial. Yeah, and then you why know, was this is a, also Nixon. heartbreaking because he's remembered making a fool of himself with these students. He was, he couldn't sleep, he was totally strung out. He thought he had caused Kent State by bombing Cambodia, he said, did I, did I do, rare moment of self-reflection, he says to Haldeman, did I do this? Did I, did I get these kids killed? So he's pretty freaked out, and he's listening to records, and he's calling everybody, and four o'clock he goes to the memorial. When he meets these kids, he's, he tries to have a meaningful conversation with them. He talks about spiritual renewal, about finding yourself. It's his earnest attempt to have a deep conversation with kids. They look at him. What the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> and they, one of them says to Cambridge, well, you want to talk about football and surfing, meaning just trivial stuff. He did ask them about football and surfing, but they left out. You know, he tried to talk to them about Churchill. They didn't even know who Churchill was. Uh, but it was, so it was just classic ships passing in the night. And uh, it's sort of sad, because I think it was Nixon's clumsy, halting effort to relate to young people today and it's it the most amazing fire. scene of our lifetime, almost. I mean, if you want to make it. Because, I mean, the Secret Service was under We're totally freaked out by it, of course. Of I mean, course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And they want to hustle him out of there. Uh, but he just went there. 
and he just went there with it. He and Manolo. He wanted to show, it's sort of sweet, he wants to show Manolo his, his aid, American mind. He wants to take him to the Lincoln Memorial. So they go up, because Nixon was a great patriot. I know he disgraced his country, but he was a great patriot who loved his country, always talking about, you know, the American flag lapel? Nixon put that in. Uh, he used to go to, down to the Potomac, and they would stop at Mount Vernon, and naval custom is you stop and salute the flag, and people play the national anthem. He'd have a couple of drinks, and he'd go, louder, louder, as he's <laughs> saluting the flag. <laughs> and it was, you can make fun of it, it's but it's, it's deeply patriotic. He, he did love his country. And the last part of the question was, he is the most successful politician, and it yeah. is the age of Nixon. Well, he runs on five national tickets and wins four times. Only FDR has done that. Uh, he wins in 1972, largest landslide in history. I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote the book was how is a guy so shy? How did a guy who's that shy, and he was really shy, become one of the most successful political figures in American history? How did that happen? And it's, you have to read the book to get the full. <laughs> yeah, but the greatest landslide in 72, well, right? Is Vietnam. The, the, the short answer is because he was an outsider, he knew how to appeal to outsiders. When he gets to college, what are your college? There's a fraternity for the cool guys, the Franklins. Nixon starts a fraternity for the uncool guys because there are more of them. <laughs> and he wins student body president, always running against the establishment. Uh, and what resonance does that have today on the resentment that is causing this political Well, if he would it? understand it, I mean, he would get Trump in a second. Uh, and, you know, people like to, he, Nixon created the modern Republican Party. In 1972, he won 35 percent of registered Democrats. He could peel them away by, by playing to their resentment, hopes and their fears, but their fears. So he under, would understand. But here's the big difference. Nixon actually believed in getting stuff done. Nixon worked with a, he's the first president in 100 years to have the Congress controlled by the other party, totally. Nixon passed a raft of legislation, social welfare legislation, environmental legislation, lowering the, I mean, they did, you look at the list goes on and on and on because he made deals, constantly making deals. Were they expedient? Yes. He wanted to do an end run on Muskie. Muskie was the big environmental senator. Nixon thought he's going to run in 72. So Nixon, to outsmart Muskie, introduces the EPA. So he was being politically expedient, but we got the EPA mm -hmm. out of it, and that was the right result. Nixon you know, signed clean air, clean water. Of course, doesn't invite Muskie to the signing ceremony, <laughs> pettiness and spite. But, but he, does, he does a lot. That's a big difference. Nixon would look at those guys up there and shake his head and worry about the republic. Don't blame him. Yes, Greg. <laughs> Greg Craig has gotten three shout outs already, so we give him a microphone. <laughs> Speaking for Edward Bennett Williams. The Republican Party to us, Evan, but one of the things that's interesting to me is how Richard Nixon in 1962 at the very bottom of any political career could be nominated by his party just six years later. Yeah. What's your explanation for that? Well, he's, he is a political genius, and he planned ahead. He did a number of things that were really smart. One is raising, raise, well, kind of obvious, but he starts raising money early. He gets Maury Stans and all those guys to shake down the Wall Street people. Uh, he goes out and he appears for every congressman everywhere. He's on the road all the time. And in 66, when the Republicans do well, Nixon has campaigned for pretty much all of them. He was relentless. Tireless. He hated people, or se seemed to hate people, but it sure didn't stop him from getting on an airplane and flying out the campaign from some really obscure congressman. So he picked up a lot of IOUs. Remember, you know, this is the 1960s. The party is still run by the establishment, and so he's picking up establishment points. Uh, he's smart enough to get out of Dodge. This is very intuitive. Crazy time, 1967, and, and Rockefeller and Romney are kind of floundering around. Nixon leaves the country and goes abroad for like six months. He takes a hiatus from his campaign. He's raising money, but he physically has gone partly to talk to De Gaulle and Adenauer and, and sort of brush up his foreign policy bona fide, but partly to get off the radar screen. Let those other guys mm. screw up. You know, let them be out there fielding questions, impossible to answer questions about what we're gonna do about Vietnam. And then he only comes, he comes in pretty late. He declares in February 1968, he declares on the eve of the uh, uh, New Hampshire primary. So he's been really laying low in a way you probably couldn't do today. It's, it's probably not analogous cause, mm. just because of our, our, our technology. And the alternatives were Rockefeller, 
Romney and, and, and Reagan uh, comes in. Reagan is the threat at the very end. Uh, and Nixon's really worried that uh, the South is going to swing to, uh, to uh, Strom Thurmond. There's a sweaty scene with Strom Thurmond where Nixon thinks that Strom is going to ask him to endorse what they call free choice, which basically was segregated schools, which Nixon really doesn't want to do. And they're in the car, and the question's coming. And if Ron, if Thurmond, who was savvy himself, says, are you going to be against communism? Yes. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Neil Ferguson's book, I don't know if you've read it yet, no, just no. come out on Kissinger, and it talks about the 68 period. He defends Kissinger's, the allegations yeah. Yeah. that Kissinger played yeah. both Rockefeller and yeah. Nixon in the Republican primary, yeah. and then both for Nixon and Humphrey during the Paris. Were you at the Paris Peace Talks in 68? Are you that old? Sure. No, I went, but the, the, well, you the can answer. delegation, yeah. I saw him. Did you yeah, think he was spying on you? What? Do you think he was spying on you? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, now Ferguson defends, but I think Kissinger's clean on this. I do. There was some hanky panky, but it's not really Kissinger. It, this is a long and convoluted story, but uh, it, Nixon, Johnson, President Johnson, thought it was treason. They thought they were going behind his back to run a channel to President Chu to not, not, not make a deal. The problem with the story is that although Nixon was doing that, he did run a back channel to Chu through Madame Chennault. Oh, the yeah. problem with the story is that Chu wasn't going to make a deal anyways. It's not like Nixon said, don't make a deal, and he said, OK, I won't. Chu wasn't going to make a deal because it was going to be the end of Chu. It's very much borne out by Chu's behavior. In 72, years four years later. So it's one of those stories which has the appearance of a really a tr almost a treason, treason of treason. but. The predicate is, is wrong because Chu wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, that's the way I have it in my and there's a, own and there's little a record, book. Yeah. There's a record of Ambassador Bunker's meetings with Chu yeah. where it's all over. Yeah. yeah. All right. Clark Irvin. Um, Evan, I love the book, Devour the Lunch. I'm just quick question. What do you make of Nixon claims that himself and that of others that what he did wasn't all that different from what the King did and what Jay did? It was just the press hated him and um, he got caught. Well, I mean, he did do some of, you know, you, you can make that case. Uh, uh, where did Nixon learn about dirty tricks? He would claim from the Kennedys in 1960. You know this phrase, walking around money, where you pay off the local preachers? The Kennedys did that. Nixon learned to do that from them. Bobby Kennedy was pretty good at dirty tricks. And uh, I know this from my own biography. He had some pretty, pretty smart guys working for him. Nixon was got in trouble in 68 for, and later for abusing the IRS. True. But Nixon's own tax returns <coughs> were audited in 1961, 1962, and 1963 by Bobby Kennedy. Right? So he, he learned a few things from the Kennedys. Nixon exaggerated the Kennedy dirty tricks. They weren't <coughs> as bad as Nixon said, but they weren't <laughs> nothing either. And, uh, you know, Johnson was not an innocent, to put it mildly, and did use the FBI to spy on his political opponents. Uh, and you know, Hoover did a lot of bad stuff. Now, is it, it, it part of the problem is moral equivalence is times change. Nixon should have been smart enough, smart, leaving aside the ethics, should have been smart enough to see that things times were changing, that the FBI was getting out of the business of spying for presidents for a reason, that the courts, you know, Congress passed, uh, the courts changed their interpretation of how much leeway a president had to wiretap, I forget what the decision was, maybe Greg remembers, but it's about this time, the Supreme Court changes the rules on whether you can wiretap. Nixon, clever guy that he was, should have understand that. But his rage and his frustration and his paranoia got the better of him and warped his political judgment. I know there are other questions, but they're all answered in this book. <laughs> the book is for sale out there. It's always a pleasure to be with Evan. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's hang around, talk, get the book, get something to drink. Great. Thank you. Bravo. <laughs> Very good. Oh, uh, we got a deep in the Vietnam. Yeah, That's yeah. right. Hey, Senator. How are you doing? Good, good to, to see you. See. Hey, Kathy and I. Nice John. to see you. I, I knew Nixon fairly well. You know, and I was elected in 72.